Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you in the name of our Savior Jesus. We have special service we're celebrating here this morning. First of all, because we have a, mis a guest preacher with us, Mr. Hans Tomford is his name. He's a senior in his last year at our Wisconsin Lutheran <laughs> Seminary. He's coming to share the word with you and let you know how things are going uh, back on the hill. So uh, I'd like to keep us up to date on how our ministry training program is going in our wells. It's great to have you here, Hans. As a part of what he is talking about today, our theme for the day is Christ's love, our calling. Kind of tells us who we are. We are gathered here because Christ loved us enough in order to make us his children. It also tells us what we do. We tell people about Christ's love and how much he loves us and how much he loves them enough even that he loved us enough to save us for heaven. So Christ's love, our calling is what we're going to be talking about today. If you have had a chance to page through your service folder, and hopefully you picked up on the way in, you will see that we are using an order of service that we don't often use. We've used it before, but it's maybe not just all that familiar to you. It's called the Order of Morning Praise, a different one that we have sometimes used in the past. If you can sing along to it, we absolutely invite you to do it. Uh, but if you're more comfortable sitting and listening, you totally understand that too. What I do want you to know is that there are three songs that are in the liturgy. The first one that comes up is, Come, O Come, Let Us Sing to the Lord, and then the psalm, and then You Are God, We Praise You, comes after the sermon. When we begin those psalms with a refrain, a lead singer is going to sing the refrain once, and then we will sing the refrain right again. So, uh, again, you are willing, uh, you are totally able to sing along with us if you want to. You can follow along on the PowerPoint if it helps you there. Our opening hymn for today is hymn number 573, Hark the Voice of Jesus Christ. Let's sing that together after we take a few moments for silent prayer and meditation, prepare our hearts for worship. God bless us.
devotion and holy deeds. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson from God's Word for this morning comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. It is a natural response of faith to want to give back to the God who has given so much to us first. And so Christ's love, our calling, isn't just a, a, a nice catchphrase. It's actually a great description of a Christian's life of faith. And it's a real description of Hannah, the mother of Samuel, that we're going to read about here. She gave her son as a gift of service back to the Lord, who had given him as a gift of life first to her. And we can do that same thing as we give our gifts of service, whether they be our own service or whether we offer our children to study for the ministry just the same way that Hannah did. When the man Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband, told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good of his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. This is the word of our Lord. Let's continue now with our psalm of the day. It's Psalm 63. It's printed there for you on page 6. Again, we will have the lead singer sing the first refrain, then we will sing the refrain right afterwards, and we'll follow the directions that are printed from there. In the morning I will sing, I will sing glad songs to you, I will sing glad songs of
lesson from God's Word for this morning it comes from the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 9 through 15. Christ's love, our calling, is not just a good description of the Christian life, it's also a great description of a Christian's message. Christ's love needs to be shared with this world. The good news of what Christ has done for us, God has called us to take to the ends of the earth. That's because everyone needs to hear it in order to believe it. And when people believe it, as the reading is going to say, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the word of our Lord. We'll continue now with the praise choir anthem above all.
Let's speak together then the seasonal response that is printed on page 7 in your service folder, the seasonal response for this season of Pentecost. Alleluia. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Alleluia. And out of respect for the words and works of our Lord, please stand for the gospel lesson. Today's Gospel comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink, or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink, and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated, and I would invite the children to come forward at this time for the children's sermon. Let's gather down around the baptismal pond here. Hey, Hazel. All right, come on and gather here. Thanks everybody for coming. You don't have to you don't have to sit if you don't want to. Today we're talking about Christ's love, how much Jesus loves us, and what he calls us to do because he loves us so much. Now, I want you to look around. This is why we're gathering down here. I want you to look around everywhere you see, and I want you to point out to me how many different crosses you can many different crosses you can see. Okay, start over there. There's a cross. Over there by the hymn board. Here's one right in front of you. Uh -huh. There's one up front there. Good. There are some crosses on our green pyramids, as they're called. There are crosses. I see you looking at these. You can say those too. There are crosses on my stole, and I'm wearing one right now. There are crosses all over the place in the church, aren't there? Why do you think we have so many crosses here in the church? What does that remind us of, Brooklyn? Yeah, Jesus died on the cross for us. Why did he do that? Because he, Kristen, he cares for us because he loves us so much. Christ's love made him die on the cross for us to take away our sins and win heaven for us. Isn't that an awesome thing? But is that something that we just want to hide and not tell anybody about? No. This is why we have all these crosses in church, so that we can all see how much this means to us. But we don't want these crosses just to stay in church, right? Because there are a lot of people outside of church that might not know what Jesus did for us. And so we don't just want to have crosses in here. We want to tell people outside of here what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's what it means when we talk about Christ's love, our calling. God calls us. He wants us to tell people about how much Jesus loves us, to tell people about how much Jesus has done for us. He doesn't just want us to have crosses, that's great, but he wants us to make sure we tell everybody we can what Jesus has done for us to save us, because Jesus did that also for everyone else to save them too, so that we can go to heaven 
together. So we see all these crosses, and it's great to remind us how much Jesus loves us. So let's remember to share the cross, share Jesus' love with everybody else we know too, so they can know as well. Can we pray together? Lord Jesus, you loved us so much that you were willing to die on the cross for us. We thank you every time we see your cross. We thank you for how much you were willing to do for us, even to bring us home to heaven to be with you. Please let us take the message of your cross to everyone we know and out to the ends of the earth. Let us work together so that everyone in this world can one day know who you are and what you have done for us to save us. Please bless us and let us carry out your work to your glory. Let me pray. Amen. Thanks, guys, for coming up. Head back to your seats. Let's continue now with our hymn of the day. It's hymn number 577, Rise, O Light of Gentile Nation. just the theme that you also share with those professors and seminarians at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. It's more than a theme. It's more than a slogan. It's a way of life. It's what's kept us alive for hundreds and thousands of years. As it's kept me alive the last couple of years studying to be a pastor. 
studying in New Ulm, Minnesota, studying last year as I bickered or interned down in Texas, even has kept me alive these last couple weeks. And I know the food in New Ulm, Minnesota was pretty good, especially that good German food, and maybe even um, expected when your name is Hans. <laughs> the southern food, the brisket, and the good temperatures down in Texas were a good part of life the last year. And even these last couple of weeks at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, that place and the dorms have met all of my needs. But that theme, that slogan, is what has kept me alive as it has you. Because of Christ's love and our calling. Because Christ's love stands firm and sure in your life and mine and always has in a life that's filled with sin. In a world that's filled with evil, filled with the devil and his temptations, Christ's love stands forever. Christ's love assures me as it assured you what truly matters in this world. And then it's our calling to go out into the world and to spread that same love, to show people Christ's love with all people. And this morning, we can look at that theme. Look at it and, and compare it to our gospel story. And look at Christ's love through a little different facet as we turn that gospel diamond and look at it with a little different zeal. And look at what Jesus told those disciples, how he wanted them to find greatness not in themselves, but in him. And how that story relates to our lives as well. Because it helps us see. Because it reminds us what Christ has done in our lives. Because our lives do relate a lot to those disciples. And this morning we look at this story, this encounter between Jesus and two of his disciples and also the rest at the end of the verses and look and are reminded that we find greatness. Find greatness in Christ's service to you and to me. And we find greatness in our service to him. Looking back at that story from Mark chapter 10, maybe there's a couple thoughts in your head going on as you start to read these verses and look at it. That the disciples in their lives, more often than not, were always struggling with something. They always knew who Jesus was and what Jesus could do. And you could say, or say it in another way, that they always knew there was greatness in their lives. But that they always didn't understand the connection from their life to Jesus. And really, how we're going to see that Jesus had given them a greatness and was going to give them a greatness already. You might remember some times in the disciples' lives when they got to see and witness and see greatness as an example before them. When they were called, for instance, Jesus came to those fishermen and said, Come follow me, you're no longer going to be fishermen, but fishers of men. And they went and left everything. They knew their jobs, and they followed someone worthy of greatness. Jesus commissioned 12 disciples to go out and to preach and to teach and to show other people the greatness he had given them. And he even gave them greatness themselves because they could perform miraculous things to give glory to God's greatness. But those disciples got to see a boy's dinner displayed over 5,000 people as Jesus took that food and performed a miraculous wonder. Even the two disciples... James and John in our story got to see Jesus transfiguring up on that mountain, his face radiant like the sun, and his clothes white like snow. And the story comes at the end of Jesus' ministry, so maybe you kind of wonder a little bit, the disciples just can't get it right, can't they? Time after time, they see greatness before their very eyes, and they don't understand the connection which is where we find ourselves looking at this disciples' story today as those disciples don't understand. But we see someone yet again tell and explain with careful words, with questions, to get them to understand that they weren't finding greatness in themselves, in their actions, in their thoughts, in their words, and how they thought it should come to them, but they were going to find greatness in what Jesus was going to give and remind them. 
as we look at, at the plea that James and John said to Jesus, we read again our, our verse at the beginning, verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. I don't know if I would have asked Jesus that that morning. Jesus could have said a lot of things. Maybe if we were in the shoes of Jesus, we should have said a lot of things. Because the disciples still couldn't get it right. But Jesus was their Savior. Jesus was their teacher. And he wanted them to be reminded about the greatness he was going to give them. And so he started to get them to think. He said, what do you want me to give you? And those disciples answered, we want us to be able to sit on your right and on your left. And listen to Jesus' reply. He said, you don't know what you're asking. He said, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And maybe we get to stop again because the disciples answered in a way maybe we never would have imagined. We can, they said. We can't do this. We can't gain glory on our own terms. Jesus said they were going to suffer. They were going to die. To drink the cup was a Jewish expression for suffering and to be baptized in the baptism of Jesus wasn't a baptism by the Holy Spirit. It was a metaphor for a baptism unto death. And they were going to suffer. They were going to die. They were sinful human beings. They were human but unlike Jesus, who was true God and true man, they weren't going to gain glory or greatness on their terms. That was God's. That was the Lord's alone to give. Take a step back from the story, and maybe at first glance we look at it and realize, I can't believe what the disciples have done. It seems like a simple story when yet time and time again they missed the point. They didn't understand how Jesus' greatness connected to their lives. And we say that on one hand, but on the other hand, it reveals a huge and our biggest problem in our lives. Because when we put ourselves in those disciples' sandals, we realize that we have Jesus in front of us. We have seen him time and time again. We have his word before our very eyes every single day, and yet again, we fail to understand the connection. Because we're not looking at number one Jesus. We're looking at ourselves. We're looking at ourselves over and over again without our own thinking, without our own, without our own choosing. And we wake up, and the first thing on our, is on our mind is, what do I have to do today? How do I look to other people? If I volunteer, if I go up to someone, I hope they think a little bit better of me because of what I have done. All of a sudden, we know and we realize that we are guilty and sinful people and that we fall into the same temptation, the same spot that the disciples were at that moment. James and John. But at the same time, Jesus gives us greatness through his life. Jesus reminds us that yet, while we were still sinners, he died for us. Paul tells us and says it so beautifully, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, for you and for me, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And it's through Christ's humble life. It's through his ambition. It's through him every single day waking up and living a perfect life and thinking about number one, which was you and me. So we can have the full assurance and the full peace that we struggle every day. We struggle with finding greatness, but he gives in our minds and keeps on reminding us every single time we look at his word, we look at baptism, we look at the sacraments, and we see that he displays a greatness he shows us that connection. He shows us the greatness through him in his service to you and to me. And it's with that thought, it's with that greatness displayed to you by your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ, 
that you can take a step out into this world. That you can take out and you can live your life. You can go through life struggling but knowing the greatness you have and serving your Lord. In fact, looking back at the story, that's exactly what he wanted. Not only those two disciples to realize, but also the ten. Because those ten were in the same exact spot that James and John were in. Mark tells us in verse 41 that when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus wanted those ten to see as he wants all of you to see as well. He used an illustration that day for them. He said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. But maybe the best part, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first must be slave of all. Giving and telling and showing those disciples his greatness and how nothing else mattered in their lives. That after he was gone, they could go out and they could serve their brothers and sisters. They could proclaim God's message. Whether they had a ton of authority in their life and they ruled over a lot of people, or they found themselves in the lowest place in life. Because no matter what, nothing could be taken away from them. Because it was Jesus who had made them great. And they could step out into that world and serve their Lord and be an example. Proclaim God's message. Proclaim Christ's greatness to all people. And the same goes in our lives of service to Him as well. That we find greatness. That each of us have special gifts and talents. Not the same ones, but different ones we each have been blessed with. Blessed if you're a grandma or a grandpa or a mom or dad or a widow or single or young or old or somewhere in between. Or a lot of hair on your head or not much hair. God has given you wonderful blessings, wonderful talents, to go out into this world and serve your Lord. Because he has made you great in every way unimaginable. In a way that doesn't even sound right to our human reason, he displays and he gives you the gospel. Freedom and comfort in your lives. He wants all people to know that. To come to the knowledge of the truth and believe in him and receive that forgiveness of sins. And it's also in that service that this morning we look, we look at supporting those men who have gifts and, and talents like you, different gifts and talents, who proclaim God's message in the public ministry. If that's teachers, or pastors, or principals, or Sunday school workers, or elders. People who go out and care for the proclamation of the gospel in a public way. People who go out and represent you, who take that message to the ends of the earth. People who go out, love those people. People who go out and love you. And want you to be reminded about Christ's love and our calling in this world. And that in our life of service, we can support. We can build up. We can pray. We can encourage. We can give our thanks and our praise and our gifts to people, to institutions uh, like that. Because they care for God's gospel message in a public way. Because they care for our children. And because they care for us. And as a student at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary where that support is going on, I can tell you from our professors and from our students and from my friends, thank you for your support. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your life of service and proclaiming and supporting God's gospel ministry. It's why we call the seminary, the school, the institution in, in Mequon, Wisconsin, the seminary, because it means seat bed. It's a place where professors, where faculty members train up the next generation of pastors. The next generation to serve you with God's gospel message. The next generation so that God's word truly can be our great heritage forever. It's Christ's love and our calling, which motivates us. Which motivates us to look at what God wants, that he wants there to be pastors and teachers and people to publicly help us in our lives. It's one of the biggest blessings. It's 
It's Christ's love and our calling which motivates us to go out every single day and this morning to be reminded about that greatness in our lives. That guilt weighs on our hearts. That worries and anxieties go through our mind and yet Christ called for great. Christ was the first person who served you. And as Mark says here at the end in verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We can be motivated. We can thank and praise our Lord, and we can step out into this world and serve him. Because he's given us a greatness unlike any other. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's continue now with our next song, You Are God, We Praise You. As a reminder, the lead singer will sing the first refrain, and we will sing the refrain again right after, and then continue on with instructions as printed. You are God, we praise you.
stand. Let's continue now with Lord Have Mercy on the top of page 10 in your service book. God's word is our prayer here. 